And now it's my pleasure to introduce Joe Livernoise. Um, he is a well-known local journalist and will provide a synopsis on the state of local journalism, revealing how important issues about our area are reported in the current political, social, and economic climate. Joe worked for a couple of locally, local weeklies, including the Pinecone, before joining the Herald, where for about 30 years he went from copy editor, reporter, bureau chief, columnist, agitator, headache collector, and administrator, before falling on his sword in 2010. And I think he'll explain to us why he fell on his sword and why so many others are doing the same. But what's most exciting is what Joe is doing now. And you can see uh, up here the homepage of VOMB, Voices of Monterey Bay, which he co-founded in 2017 with several other veteran local reporters. This new journalistic vision is bilingual, online only, nonprofit, serves the Central Coast, Monterey, and Santa Cruz counties, and I'm sure San Benito is included in that, isn't it? So this uh, gives all of us an opportunity to express ourselves or even to report, and I hope that you will all consider taking advantage of it, put it on your uh, regular websites that you look at, and perhaps write a letter or an article for them. They, they uh, are happy to have, have you. Uh, Royal Calkins, former editor of the uh, Herald, writes his column, The Partisan, from this website, Voices of Monterey Bay. And they also offer journalism training uh, by veteran reporters to interested adults and youth with the hope that the work that they produce will be featured on VOMB. Joe lived in Prunedale for many decades before he moved to Monterey five years ago. Please welcome Joe Livernoise. I hope that we don't have any rolling blackouts, you know, because that'd be another thing that we'd have to blame PG&E for. <clears throat> rolling blackouts. That was the name of my uh, college roommate, rolling blackouts. <clears throat> I wanted to say that in all the excitement about my appearance here today, I was uh, forwarded an email exchange that caught my attention. Uh, the original send, uh, sender, who I understand just showed up, uh, it encouraged people to bring uh, friends to this soiree because he said, it should be an interesting talk by someone who has an ax to grind. <laughs> well, Mr. Fosler, uh, I learned a lot uh, during my long career as a journalist, and there's one thing that I've come to learn the hard way. There's no such thing as an interesting talk by someone who has an ax to grind. <laughs> Trust me, I've heard a lot of people grinding their axes at me, thinking I should be interested, and the things they have to say are almost always the least interesting things I have ever heard. With that said, I hope my presentation today is interesting without veering into axe grindy. <laughs> anyway, yes, I am a Joe Livernoise, and I'm a journalist, and I worked for local newspapers for 35 years. I showed this to say that before I came to Monterey County, I worked for a, a daily paper in my home region of Imperial County. I'm originally from El Centro, California. And after college, I went back there and became the agriculture writer, thinking that I was going to be writing about lettuce nematodes. <laughs> but it turns out that a week after I got there, uh, a United Farm Workers strike uh, of 1979 started, and, uh, and I was, happened to be the farm writer. So I spent two years covering the United Farm Workers, and it was great. And if you look at the, in the far, uh, what is that, the corner there? That's me. That, and, uh, and the reason I show this is because, you know, I, I used to be a handsome devil. <laughs> but then also, um, this particular photo was shot by the, uh, a, a guy with the, from the LA Times. He was a photographer for the LA Times. And this particular photo is, con is now hanging at the Smithsonian Institute. <laughs> Thank you. 
So I'm a face in the crowd at the Smithsonian. Anyway, I, I ended up in Monterey County because I didn't like Imperial Valley and I loved Monterey County. Um, I worked at a bunch of newspapers here, including a, a thing called the North County News for a long time and for the Carmel Pinecone for a couple of years. And then I ended up at the uh, Monterey County Herald because it was such a dream job. <laughs> Until I gave up the ghost uh, several years ago and helped co-found a nonprofit news operation on the Monterey uh, Bay. So with all that experience, I'm here today to talk about news geeks, vulture capitalists, and stories told. So to set the scene, let me uh, start with a story I ran across uh, the other day on longreads.com. It was about the problems that concerned citizens of the world are having trying to message the issue of climate change. And this is the paragraph from that story. In 2011, the Columbia Journal Journalism Review and ProPublica co-published a long feature by John Sullivan called True Enough about the rise of PR, public relations professionals, and the fall of journalists. In the opening paragraph, a reporter for the New York Times named David Barstow describes going down to Houston to cover the Deepwater Horizon spill and finding, to his horror, quote, more PR people representing these big players than there were reporters, sometimes by a factor of two or three. At the time, there were about three professionals for every one journalist. Today, there are six, and the gap between PR and journalism is shrinking rapidly. Uh, John Nichols from The Nation uh, wrote, there is an overwhelming sense that void that is created by the collapse of traditional journalism is not being filled by new media, but by public relations. So, and we see it everywhere. I see it everywhere. And that's the state of the world uh, these days, and that's the situation that journalists are fighting. Um, so, how did we get there? I'm gonna start with my own story. I started working at the Herald back in 1982, back when it was located on Pacific and Jefferson Street. It's now the Monterey Institute of uh, International Studies. When I showed up, uh, this was the operation inside the building. <laughs> I was 30 years old at the time, 30, uh, and when I came to the Herald, and at the time, I was the youngest person in the newsroom by far. I mean, I, uh, the, the, the next youngest person was in their 40s. But it was great. I was surrounded by an entire room full of crusty old reporters and editors. They smoked and they cussed and they drank like fish. They were old school. They'd all been around since forever. They had all hung out with John Steinbeck. <laughs> They'd all gotten drunk with uh, Ed Ricketts. They knew their way around town and they knew where all the bodies were buried. If you were around back then, you'd know some of the names. There was Jane Parker's dad, Brad Parker. Uh, uh, Bob Bullock was there, so was Mary Thornburg, Tom Weeder, Sue Bernhardt. All these people were legends in my mind. I was originally hired to work the copy desk. It was a place populated by the really old guys, the guys who couldn't get around like they used to, guys who had lost their driver's, driver's licenses <laughs> because of old age or new DUIs. <laughs> they were really old and barely useful, except that they had mastered the English language and they knew the Monterey Peninsula like the back of the, their hand. And, and they had this institutional knowledge that took them far. And, and I was able to learn so much from them. At the time, now imagine this, I was one of 14 copy editors on the copy desk. 14. There were 20 reporters in the newsroom, with two or three others working out of the Salinas Bureau. The Herald had a six-person sports department. We had a features department with six journalists, including a society editor, the great Anne Germain. We had theater critics. We had Joe Fitzpatrick. I don't know if you remember that guy. He was like the Herb Kane of, um, of Monterey County. We had music writers 
who would dash in right after a show and we'd hold the paper up to, for him to finish, or him or her to finish up their, um, their reviews. Newspaper was, uh, the Herald was supported by a newspaper infrastructure totaling 400 employees. We had pressmen, press operators, circulation specialists, advertising salespeople. We had people working there I had no clue what they were doing. <laughs> but together, we cranked out a daily miracle. Every single day, we produced a newspaper filled with lots of local news. We had city beats filled with reporters who covered every city on the peninsula. We had cop reporters, court reporters, cub reporters, county reporters, political reporters. We covered the hell out of Monterey County, and we covered every issue in town, and we wrote about every, everyone and everything, and I was proud to be a part of it then. It all seemed so romantic back then, but maybe it only sounds like sour grapes today. Maybe it sounds like I'm grinding axes. <laughs> Am I? I don't think so. Because times change. Uh, time always changes, and I know that. Expectations change, technology changes. A world without change would be quite boring, right? And I stuck it out for 30 years. I had 30 good years at the, uh, <laughs> at the Herald. And, and while, while I was there, the Herald got bought and sold like so many widgets. We were sold to Scripps Howard. We were sold to Knight Ritter. We were sold to a couple of other chains. McClatchy, Christina, who were you working for when you were there? Knight Ritter. Knight Ritter. Okay. We were, Christina Medina is here. Thank you, Christina, for showing up. And she was, uh, she was both a Californian and then I... I I did her the favor of bringing her to the, to the Herald, and that wasn't so much of a favor as it turns out. But. <laughs> yeah, yeah, bottle of water. <laughs> bottle of water. Doesn't take much. We were sold to a couple other chains. Um, McClatchy, McClatchy, the, the Sacramento Bee people, had us for about three minutes, literally three minutes, in, in this transactional thing that had happened. And I, I'm not making this one up. The Herald was once included in a transaction as a player to be named later. <laughs> that, that one involved the Block family and the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette somehow. So anyway, through it all, the journalists at the Herald Newsroom were committed to serving Monterey County readers. I know it sounds naive, especially today, but we were all news nerds, news geeks. We believed that newspapers were an important community asset. We believe that an informed public was an engaged public. We believe that a public that understood what was going on in the world around them would help keep democracy alive. We also recognize that the Monterey Peninsula was unlike a lot of other communities. The people here are active, educated, sophisticated, engaged in their communities. They are readers. They are newspaper readers. They relied on the Herald to tell them things about their community that they didn't already know. And when we succeeded in that mission, they appreciated it. Over the years at the Herald, I was a copy editor, reporter, a bureau chief columnist, city editor twice, I was a city editor twice, and I eventually wheedled my way up the chain of command at the Herald to become, ta-da, the executive editor. And I was in charge of the entire newsroom. And that might have been a big deal 15 years ago, but this happened about 10 years ago. By then, the entire landscape for newspapers had changed. It had already changed at the Herald. Gone were the newspaper chains that had actually understood the mission of journalism. Knight Ritter uh, disappeared in a cloud of surrender. The failure of Knight Ritter might have been the most heartbreaking uh, event for journalism in the region. Knight Ritter had its faults, but it, uh, it actually tried hard to be tough and responsible. Knight Ritter ran some of the most aggressive newspapers in the, in the country. It hired great investigative reporters. It won dozens of uh, Pulitzers. It invested heavily in its newsroom, um, and it provided bottled water, <laughs> uh, until suddenly it just couldn't keep up, probably because it was giving away so much water. There were lots of reasons for it, though. The digital revolution had a lot to do with it. Craigslist killed advert uh, classified advertising in newspapers. Uh, those of you who remember the, the San Jose Mercury from way back when, uh, when remembered six or seven 
full sections of nothing but uh, help wanted ads. Uh, Silicon Valley was booming, and uh, that's, that's really what kept uh, the, the mercury afloat. And no one liked to think of news as a commodity to be bought and sold, so newspapers put up their stories online trying to keep up, but they, they did it for free. So there was no real good reason to actually buy a newspaper if you could see it online, or to buy an ad uh, for the newspaper. To its, uh, to its credit, Knight Ritter did understand that the digital revolution was changing the dynamics and the business model for uh, of, of journalism. Uh, the delivery of uh, journalism was changing, and remember, change is good. So the corporate titles at Knight Ritter boldly moved their corporate offices in, Ma in Miami to San Jose. You might remember this building. It was right in the flight path. I mean, you, the wind shear would, uh, of a plane's landing would, well, it's kind of like Monterey, actually, so... <laughs> Knight Ritter thrust themselves headlong into the Silicon Valley and they absorbed the new technology and they would figure out how to change the technology. They would make it all work, except that they didn't. Panic set in and Knight Ritter started cutting its staff. Investigative reporting and foreign bureaus were uh, expensive, so Knight Ritter started shutting it all down. And eventually they sold it all to a cut rate newspaper vendor. That's pretty much when I became managing editor. Lucky me. The Herald and the Santa Cruz Sentinel got sucked up by Digital First Media, a company that uh, held by a venture capitalist who works more like a vulture capitalist. The hundred or so local newspapers under the Digital First Media uh, banner are practically irrelevant today. Digital First Media slashes and burns and it raises advertising rates. Oh, delivery rates to um, Loyal customers are through the roof, and they have, and there's no reporters, and there's no editors, and there's no photographers, and they don't care about community service, and they don't care if the paper showed up at your door this morning, and they don't care about anything ex except squeezing whatever dimes, nickels, and quarters they can get out of the local paper. Now, well, does that sound like I'm grinding axes? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. But I'm speaking the truth. You all see it. You see it every day. You, does a, does, have you tried calling circulation lately? But that doesn't mean uh, community journalism is dead. I still believe that the, the demand for news remains strong. In my mind, there is really no substitute for local newspapers in smaller communities. Newspapers unify communities like few other enterprises. They are a common bond. Local journalists can tell you whatever, uh, tell you what happened at the Sand City uh, City Council last night, and they can tell you who won yesterday's uh, high school baseball game. Local community papers can deliver local news uh, that you won't be able to get any other way. Local news operations have real value, and I'm convinced even today that a local newspaper that understands its value in the community um, they serve can continue to th thrive especially in the community that's as active and educated and sophisticated as the Monterey Peninsula. I'm convinced that local newspapers that treat its community, uh, communities with respect can succeed. I've seen that happen elsewhere. I can see it happening here. Um, unfortunately, it didn't happen with the Monterey County Herald. And I could bore you for hours about what uh, did and didn't happen at the Herald, and I won't do it today, except to say that the Herald and dozens of other local community newspapers across the country fell into the clutches of that venture, uh, vulture capitalist. Um, and I think the Monterey Peninsula deserves better than what it's getting. That is why, about eight years ago, I gave up the ghost. <laughs> Did you miss that news? That, that, that was, that's like a, that's a collector's piece right there. It broke my heart to leave the Herald, but it, uh, my pers I felt my personal integrity was at stake. I'd spent 30 years developing a reputation in this town. And uh, instead of making plans to improve our news operations as, a, as an executive editor, I'd spent all my days trying to figure out who I was going to lay off next. And it was aggravating because I could read financial statements and I could see how much revenue was leaving this community to en enrich the vulture capitalist. 
The numbers in this slide are from 2017, several years after I left the Herald. But they are representative of the uh, numbers that I was seeing before I left. It shows that the Northern California region for digital first media earned $11 million uh, in 2017, a 21% profit margin. That is the year that the last, the last copy editor at the Herald was laid off. She and several others at the Herald were shown the door that year, and dozens more were let go throughout the entire chain in 2017. So the Herald continues its slide into irrelevance, where once it employed around 400 people, a couple dozen uh, people work there now. It doesn't have a copy desk, as I mentioned. And those editorial functions are now being handled in Chico. The Herald doesn't have its own press anymore. It doesn't even have its own building. Um, because it doesn't have its own press, uh, the, the, the Herald is being printed up in Santa Clara County somewhere, which means that local deadline, the deadline for news on a daily paper for uh, the Monterey County Herald is 2 p.m., 2 p.m. So if anything happens after 2 p.m., you won't be reading about it in the next day's paper. <clears throat> it doesn't even have its own building anymore. Um, in the newsroom, it laid off its last photographer a couple of months ago. The fact of the matter is that the Monterey County Herald now employs about as many journalists as the Monterey County Weekly, right? That's right. There's no way I can describe in 40 minutes what has happened to the Herald. That would require a master class. But my colleague, Julie Reynolds Martinez, has in investigated the bejabbers out of Digital First Media and Alden Golden Capital. She's written story after story about it, and her reporting has appeared in Time Magazine and The Nation. She appeared a couple of months ago in Washington, Washington D.C. to testify about vulture capitalism in support of something called the Stop Wall Street Looting Act, which is sponsored by uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren. So Julie knows her stuff. So, and to illustrate how convoluted uh, Alden Capital, Global Capital's operations might be, she created what she calls the Alden Capital, uh, Global Capital Crazy Wall, which is here, but it's also there. In order for her to keep track of what was happening, she actually did one of those crazy wall things like you see in The Wire or uh, <laughs> some of these cop shows. So what, what this shows is like the top part uh, of this is, uh, are, are all the shell companies and uh, different companies that uh, Alden Global Capital has set up, many of them in the Cayman Islands. And then the bottom part are the newspaper operations and other companies uh, that they uh, purchased that they are sucking dry so that they can feed the beast. But, and so what does this crazy wall tell us? It tells us that the true owners of scores of US newspapers controlled by Alden are likely impossible to identify. It means that Alden, and by extension, uh, digital first media's money are confusingly blended into a mishmash of investment funds primarily owned by unknown people who may be from anywhere in the world, certainly not local. It shows a deliberate layering of offshore and domestic shell companies that have few reporting requirements because they are privately held and located in tax havens. And that's where your money goes if you subscribe to the Herald. But I'm not telling you not to subscribe to the Herald. I want you to support the Herald because I haven't given up on journalism. I haven't given up on local journalism. I still believe that people still believe in truth, justice, and the American way. And I still think that this community can support a local newspaper that could turn a tiny profit, a tidy profit, maybe tiny, <laughs> while providing an essential community service. And that could happen if the Herald ever falls into the right hands. I hope it will, and the sooner the better. But in the meantime, I'm happy to be part of a new and innovative concept in the delivery of local news. 
Not long ago, several crusty lo local newspaper veterans got together to create Voices of Monterey Bay. There's four of us in all, including myself, Claudia Melinda Salinas, she's from Salinas, uh, the aforementioned Julie uh, Reynolds Martinez, who in addition to doing great work for us is, is investigating uh, Alden Global Capital, and Kathy McKenzie, who's from uh, Prunedale. In a nutshell, Voices is a nonprofit, bilingual, online news operation. The business model is that we are not a business. <laughs> we are a nonprofit. We are a charitable organization, and we're currently working under a fiscal sponsor, but we will soon uh, be uh, obtaining our own 501c3. We cranked up about two years ago, and we can be found online at, write this down, folks, no, I'll give you a, uh, my card, voicesofmonterey.org. Our mission, like any uh, good news operation, is to educate and to advance local issues we believe are of concern to people throughout the Monterey Bay Area. Um, we don't think, we don't consider ourselves competition to the to Herald, to the Weekly, to the Pine, even the Pinecone. We, uh, we don't consider ourselves a uh, competition, but we, but we think of ourselves as supplementing the good work that a lot of these uh, 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 folks are doing, but everybody's hamstrung. Uh, not everything can get covered, so we try to find the stuff that's not uh, being covered. And we also are uh, ver dedicated to providing a voice to people who otherwise are not, um, uh, who don't have access to a lot of uh, local media. Our coverage er area includes Santa Cruz, Salinas, Monterey, Watsonville, and South Monterey County. We know um, that what's important in um, Salinas is not always so important here, but we also believe that we are connected and that it's important to understand that what happens here can have incredible impacts on what happens there and vice versa. And so we try to look at everything on a regional level. <clears throat> we also believe that there are uh, plenty of interesting stories to tell, that many of those stories aren't being told anymore. We don't do the quick hit, turn of the screw stories but we spend a lot uh, more time to dig deeper into issues. We investigate more, we talk to more people. We spend the time to really know what we're talking about. So, for instance, rather than doing a whole bunch of confusing, quick hit stories about short-term rentals and what every city and in in, in jurisdiction in the two counties are doing, we carried a full-blown analysis of the state of short-term rentals in the context of the housing market for the entire region. So, um, for instance, if uh, Carmel is going to do something on short-term rentals next week, we really don't, we're not gonna necessarily cover that, but we'll be paying attention. Everything about us is a bit different, and it's been a bit difficult for an old newspaper guy like me to, uh, you know, was, uh, I'm a newspaper guy like me with ink running through his veins uh, to get used to uh, things. Uh, we're exclusively online, for one thing. You can't pick up a paper and read us. Um, and we're not just uh, printed words. We're heavy on printed stories, but we also do podcasts. We also do live pop-up events, showing up in communities to perform stories to live audiences, whatever it takes to tell a story. If we do uh, breaking news stories, we will usually do it in our newsletter, uh, which we send out once a week on Thursdays. And so if you don't subscribe to our newsletter, um, please do, because we always find fun little tidbits to and uh, breaking news stories to include that we include in the newsletter. Um, so we're, um, obviously, Voices of Monterey Bay is a news operation, first and foremost, but we're also committed to uh, serving as a training ground. Our goal is to work with kids um, uh, and teach them to be journalists. And if they don't want to be journalists, we can teach them to think critically to improve their news literacy so they don't get sucked in by fake news. We, we cranked up the training side of Voices of Monterey Bay three summers ago, and we've already held two two-week journalism boot camps in East Salinas um, and one in Soledad. 
during these sessions, we've had almost four dozen high school and junior uh, college students for a full immersion into journalism. They learn to research issues. They learn to interview people, which is pretty daunting when you're a high school kid. And they learn to write stories, and each of their stories are, were published online. So that's us in a nutshell. We are a nonprofit news uh, uh, journalism operation, which means that we don't rely on the old way of doing things. We don't take subscriptions. We don't sell advertising. We do fundraising. We are about to launch a membership program, sort of like PBS or NPR. We don't offer advertising, but we are open to corporate sponsorships, and we rely on philanthropy. It's exciting. Um, and nonprofit journalism is a growing phenomenon in the US. There's, uh, with every month, um, there's a, at least a half dozen new nonprofit news operations sprouting up in, uh, in the United States. And in fact, there's a, a great new, it's about two years old, uh, nonprofit news operation out of San Juan, Puerto Rico that um, was pretty much the only newspaper or the news operation left in, in San Juan that was uh, reporting what was happening during the hurricane. And uh, they're, they're also the ones that recently single-handedly pretty much toppled the governor. <laughs> so uh, they're hard charge and they're great. Um, so, and there's more than uh, 200 different nonprofit organizations uh, are members of a, a group called the Institute for Nonprofit News, which offers hands-on support for operations like ours. We belong to Institute for Nonprofit News and we get a lot of really great uh, support, um, like how to support, how, like how to run a nonprofit sort of support, how to, how to set up an uh, online news uh, site. Uh, and they've been terrific uh, help. Also helping are uh, a couple of huge foundations. Starting on November 1st, Voices of Monterey County uh, or Monterey Bay will be in a major fundraising mode. Uh, during that period, uh, two month period, money we uh, raise locally will be matched dollar for dollar uh, by the Democracy Fund and the Knight Foundation. The night found good for the nights, huh? The uh, campaign is called Newsmatch, and it's a great opportun uh, opportunity for uh, nonprofit news operations to leverage individual support for independent nonprofit news operations. We're kicking off our fundraising campaign on November 10th with our second anniversary party at the Hote Enchilada Social Club in Moss Landing. It will be a typical event, and we have, I have little flyers in the back uh, that tell you a little more about it, but there will be lots of food, entertainment, music, spoken word, and poetry performances, and better yet, the admission is free. Also, uh, we've compiled the stories and the photographs uh, produced by our Youth Media Project students into a beautiful book. Uh, and on November 3rd, we're hosting a book release party for the kids at the Salinas Downtown Bookstore on Main Street. And you're all invited to come to both of these events, and I hope you will. Um, and, and especially, you're all invited to support local nonprofit journalism. Please pay attention to uh, Voices of Monterey Bay. Uh, if, you don't, if you're not getting our newsletter, I have a sign-up sheet back there. Uh, all I need is your name and your email, um, and uh, and uh, you'll be you'll uh, what the newsletter does. In addition to the like the little tidbits I was, I was talking about, is um, it, it sort of uh, alerts you to what our major stories are for the week online. So anyway, that's my uh, that's me in a nutshell. Uh, thank you very much. I understand there's a question and answer period, right? Yes, yes, okay, I'm just going to say no to everything. Does that work? So the, the newsletter is very helpful in alerting us what's going on. But have you considered a Facebook page? Uh, yeah, we, we do have a Facebook page. Uh, I should have mentioned. I should have actually posted that. You go to Facebook to Voices of Monterey Bay. We're there. We're also on Twitter. Uh, so we're, you know, we do we do all the social medias. Thank you.
You left out uh, photo engravers when you were talking about all the employees. I am so sorry. I, I beg your pardon. <laughs> but, Luana, uh, <laughs> Lu, the great Luana Conley was our was our photo engraver and uh, and really kind of the spirit of the of the newsroom even. I mean, she would she was a sprite. She'd come oh, down there and just keep us all. That's not honest. why I said that, but thank you so much. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was a, a really great job, and it really made me nostalgic and sad for the wonderful characters that uh, the Herald yeah. had in the institutional knowledge. And I'm kind of surprised that you would recommend, after showing who the owners are, why would you not recommend that people unsubscribe? Because subscribing to that shell of a newspaper, that uh, newspaper-shaped object, in no way, <laughs> in no way does anything but support those, those uh, vulture capitalists, no. uh, the hedge fund owners. Um, no. I, I don't see how that promotes journalism at all. And in fact, if, they, if the community wanted to create a newspaper, then they'd be uh, compelled almost to want to buy that one and further enrich these uh, horrible people. I think we should start um, our own or help the weekly become a daily, you know, um, if they would uh, you know, even consider such a thing. Uh, anyway, thank you. For okay, thank you, Luana. I would just be a nice. I would just be a nice. <laughs> after, after trashing the Herald, I, I wanted to say, hey, you know, keep subscribing. And, and here's the one thing that they do do, because I still get it, because, because they, they, they still do uh, two crossword puzzles every day. Yeah. <laughs> They're the most expensive crossword puzzles you'll ever find, but... <laughs> yeah, crypto quote, yeah. We, we are uh, the antediluvians who still sub, uh, subscribe, and I want to put in a good word for Jim Johnson, and Tom, is it Lighty? And uh, who are the other ones? You know, the, the wonderful other writers of the Herald that do the in-depth reporting on water and other issues. And that, that's one of the reasons, because I know these people and I know that they need the job and I, they need to support. And, and it's true that there are, you know, what, what the, the Herald has done is they've sort of buttonholed a couple of issues that they know that they're just gonna go uh, uh, overboard with. And that's, I mean, we consciously, do not uh, dive into the water situation because uh, we're all very interested. I live in Monterey. I'm really interested in what's going on. But, um, but you know, it's being done. And so it doesn't feel like, you know, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, or maybe we should be reinventing wheels considering the way it's, it's all, all taking, uh, coming about now, right, though. There is an example of a newspaper that went through this decline and then came back. It's the Pitts, Pittsfield, uh, Massachusetts newspaper, the Berkshire Eagle. It was a yeah. wonderful, wonderful newspaper. It was gobbled up, et cetera. And then finally, in disgust, a group got together and bought the newspaper, and it's coming back to life. So it can happen. Yeah. Well. Can I just say this? Yeah. Um, that there was an effort several years ago um, to actually purchase the Herald in, this, in the Santa Cruz Sentinel. And uh, I'm really not a liberty to say too much about it, other than the fact that uh, the offer was rejected. Uh, and, but it was, it, it was, the offer was being made by a, a lot of folks with great intentions and who understood uh, good, uh, what good journalism was about and people who were willing to uh, reinvest into the, um, into, in the paper and make it you know, better. So. I am really puzzled. My question all have to do with money. The printed newspaper, their uh, subscription numbers is declining. Their marketing advertisement is down, and yet they are still posting profit. Does that mean that the subscription is enough to cover it? And take another example, in the weekly, lots locally, they have no subscription money, it's free paper. And I, I imagine they are making money, so it's really a puzzle to me. And coming back to the recent situation, what's your current budget? How much are you trying to raise in order for your organization to get to a place where you want it to be? So, good questions. The, the, um so how do so how do you just how does how do they do this? I guess the question. How does that happen? 
Uh, well, they, you know, the way the way they do it is they is that um, they lay off people. I mean, it's just they, they, they lay off, they eliminate virtually all of their resources. Uh, everything that um, their entire infrastructure. They're not. They're paying. They pay rent now. They they don't own their own properties. Um, they they're bare bones with their personnel. Um, <coughs> And yet, they still find people who are willing to pay. What I don't know how much you paying for your subscription. Yeah, so it's one hundred eighty. So that's like blah, 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 five hundred dollars for what? What are you getting? So uh, and uh, the you know and they're still able to convince advertisers that. Uh, to believe that the, that you know that they're actually reaching people. So I, I really don't get it. Um, and so what is our budget? Our budget is minuscule. Uh, the sort of the prevailing uh, wisdom is that for any nonprofit, uh, startup nonprofit, it usually takes two, two, three years to establish yourself to prove to the community that you are uh, legitimate and you're not going to go away before um, uh, most foundations are, are willing to um, fund you. And so we're just kind of hanging on. Uh, trying to make an impression in this community, uh, so and 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 relying on the philanthropic nature of individuals and and also the the major uh, foundations like Knight Ritter and the Democracy Fund to keep us going. So until we can really make a big difference, I'm you know we're uh, someday I, we'd all like to be paid for what we're doing. <laughs> Let's just say that. <laughs> Thank you. My time is up, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Livernoy. I'm sure we all have a much better feeling of where your industry is in uh, today's world. Um, I think one of the things that, that I'm coming away with is that I think Mr. Livernoy's axe might be just a little bit sharper now than it was when he walked in. <laughs> Thank you all for coming today. It's a pleasure to see so many of you here.